<laughs> Welcome everybody to our Trevor James special edition of A Screw Loose. We are absolutely thrilled to have our special guest, John Paul Wright of Trevor James Flutes. He is a, a man of many titles, <laughs> including managing director and head janitor. So <laughs> in reverse, as just one of the flute guys, so that works too. <laughs> um, so John Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. We're, we're absolutely so thrilled to have you. We've got a bunch of questions uh, from, from people in, in your Twitter feed that we can answer in, you know, an hour to just ramble. So I, I, let's get started. <laughs> so ramble, 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 ramble. <laughs> I am, uh, so first of all, I, I, uh, I do not understand. I, uh, <laughs> I, do, I, do, I, do, I am okay, so if I tried to match this terrible accent. <laughs> I speak French. Uh, really? Hello. You know, I, I have, hang on. I oh. <laughs> oh, she's got the flute hat. We've okay. only been working this, together this for a long that enough that I actually knew what she was going for. That's crazy. <laughs> what does that hat say, Sarah? It says... Thank you. Thank you for inviting... Oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't read French, so I don't know. What that is. It says, this is not a flute. Yeah. <laughs> this well, is thank, not a pipe. Thank you for inviting me to a screw loose. You know, I am the, probably the last person I would have thought to be invited on to a, a live feed with technical people. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so the, part of the reason why we, we decided to invite you on is number one, you're delightful. And number two, <laughs> we uh, have a, a really deep admiration for what Trevor James Flutes is doing in the mm -hmm. intermediate flute market because it is such a difficult line to walk to make a flute that is affordable but is also serviceable and will last. And I would even argue that that's harder to do than to build a handmade flute with an unlimited budget. So uh, mm -hmm. we just wanted to, to talk to you about that wizardry and, <laughs> and, and your part in, in bringing that to life. So- yeah. um, Should I take you back to the beginning then? Let's go back to the beginning, yes. Yeah, <laughs> because there is a person called Mr. Trevor James. I was shocked to learn this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like Betty Crocker? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is there a Betty Crocker? I think there is. I don't know, but this, I, this I'm is sorry, I better because it's flutes. Yeah, there, so. There was anyway. a Robin Crocker that used to work for us. <laughs> <Robin>. <laughs> so um, a guy called Trevor James um, was really interested in, uh, well, he was a clarinet player, um, but he had an interest in repair. We're talking the 70s, and he start, He went and learned how to repair and uh, really sort of fell into the flute world. But was in the student in, in those days, there wasn't much going on. There was like the parrot stuff from uh, China. There was East German flutes, and there was Yamaha in the student end. Mm -hmm. And he saw there was a big opening, but he didn't know what to do. But he was getting quite a lot of repairs coming through. So he formed in 1979 a, a flute shop in London. It was in Dorset Street in the centre of London, near Baker Street, Sherlock Holmes area. And it was called All Flutes Plus, just off Baker Street. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so 1979. And then uh, he, he was a bit perplexed because he was just seeing so much being returned with bent mechanism because the student flutes weren't great in those days. And London is a really weird scene, is that if you're professional, well, in those days, you weren't playing uh, American flutes or Japanese flutes, you're playing Louis Lott and old French flutes. Mm -hmm. There's a really weird pro scene. Um, but anyway, he decided to form a relationship with a chap called Dean Yang, and they actually okay. made, uh, designed uh, a student flute in the early 1980s. And they went live with a flute, which he's called after himself, Trevor James. Um, probably it worked in those days. I mean, it's very rare to call an instrument after yourself now because the world is a different place, isn't it, when it comes to branding and marketing. <laughs> um, but he called it after himself, which is fine. And um, so that was probably launched in 1983. And I joined the company after I've actually, I've written, wrote this down somewhere. I joined in 1992. And by then, they were already quite popular in Europe. Um, in fact, very popular in some parts of Europe. 
uh, number one in places like Hungary and the Eastern Bloc countries. Quite weird is that when we started, it was very Eastern centric. And then you looked at France, which is, you know, you think of France as being many people that look at that as being the home of the flute playing. Um, and we were massive in France. When I joined, I think, crikey, really? So I think if you can make it in France, you can make it in anywhere. And being, sure. half, being, half, being half French, I can say this because we're awkward. We're strange. <laughs> we like so many different things. So when I joined in 1982, I think they were selling probably about seven, six or 7,000 flutes a year. And he took a punt on me because I was a flute player. And... He took a punt and basically said, would you come in and sort of start changing the direction? Look at how everybody's doing it, because all companies did it the same. If you looked at the posters, if you looked at how they promoted themselves, it was with a picture of a flute player holding a flute. <laughs> <laughs> it, was the same. it was the same. There was sort of very little fun in it. Um, Flutes are and... fun. <laughs> <laughs> We take ourselves very seriously here. <laughs> yeah, but I was very aware. So, and I, I, I've got qualifications in business and marketing. So I, underst I understood that first thing you need to do is get to know your market. Who is your target audience? Mm -hmm. And when I went out and looked at the target audience, they were very sensible, or they were very hardworking teachers, or, get, or very frustrated repairers. <laughs> um, <laughs> And there wasn't many conventions, but I went around all to, the, to all the conventions and no one was really interested in student instruments. And, you know, I understand now, it took, took me a long time to realise that, that when you go to a convention, all you want to see is something really good, something new, something to aspire to, you know, something to look up to. You don't really want to go and look at something that you can see in a music store. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, made a, I made a proposal that we were actually went sideways in that we completely redid everything. And um, the first thing I did when I joined the company was the, came up with the Aspiring Greater Heights poster, the little girl. Yes. And should I, should I put, that, yes. put that up yes. on the screen? Yeah, beautiful poster. <laughs> I love that poster. I want one for the house, actually. And I'm not kidding about that. I've got a... <laughs> well, I found lots. I've actually found quite a few that we still have. So they are there. Uh, where, do you know this, I've done it again. <laughs> <laughs> is, is the button still there, the screen share? Should be. Yeah, is it there? It's, I'm still, it's still there. Sorry, That's sorry okay. ladies and gentlemen, I'm new to this. <laughs> Well, why, while you're screen sharing, I, could, I can fill space with words and say that um, it's quite extraordinary that a flute maker came from a repair background. That's, that I know a lot of flute makers, and that is unusual, and that's a really yes. cool um, perspective. Uh, in fact, many flute makers weren't even flute players to begin with, um, so that's, that's not uncommon, but hmm, very cool. Let's see, do I have another fact that I can... <laughs> Yeah, observation <laughs> <laughs> my screen i know my screen is flying around here <laughs> that's all right we're, we're enjoying it um so <laughs> what one of the uh, one of the things that i really enjoy about uh well, so the way that I stumbled onto Trevor James flutes, because I don't see a lot of them in my area, is actually through your photography on the <laughs> Trevor James Instagram page. So speaking of, you know, your photos. Um, so, you know, it worked back in the 90s and it's still working now. Oh, there she is. <laughs> okay. Oh, I love that poster. <laughs> that so is the I best poster. It, I called it Aspiring to Greater Heights for two reasons. First, you aspiring to be like a teacher. So you're aspiring to a higher level, mm -hmm. um, but also she's on tiptoes. So she's aspiring to be yes. tall. Yes. And we, we initially I still printed. have that aspiration. Really? <laughs> 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 yeah. Still trying. <laughs> well, before lockdown, I found 400 of the limited edition posters that have oh. been put away in the warehouse. So I still have lots of them. So oh, if anybody wow. would like one. Talk. Oh my goodness, now, of course. They're A1 size, they're really large. <laughs> oh, beautiful. That's okay. <laughs> so if anybody you wants You noticed to... that the background I've got is absolutely bare. Actually, I have, I have one poster on the fridge, but... <laughs> uh, uh, 
Wow. So that, that was the first thing I did. We printed 20,000 the first print run, and wow. we actually kept on printing them up until about five years ago, and we ended up printing about a quarter of a million. <laughs> it's <laughs> huge. That's so amazing. <laughs> but, but what, when, and the next project I did was before 3D was really popular, I, um, I did a 3D brochure mm. where I, I love photography. As, as you say, you probably get to know me by my with photographs, but the way, the way in those days to do photography was you'd take a picture of something and then you'd move it sort of three centimeters the other way. Mm -hmm. And you'd take two pictures and you'd layer them on with one red and one green layer. And you mm -hmm. would then, yeah, and then you would then have a 3D image that when you put glasses on, it would jump out at you. So I did a brochure, so 3D brochure, <laughs> and um, did it come with it, glasses? Yeah, it came with glasses. That's awesome. Light. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I think um, you should I'm bring just, that back. <laughs> it's like really? the, it's like perfect, perfect low tech. It's just it's, it's like that's outside the box. I love it. It's just cool. Yeah. And what I want to, what we were, again, this is, and this will be the the theme of today is experimenting, which is what. I believe everybody should be doing. Um, it still hasn't come up, has it, my 3D brochure? Not yet. <laughs> 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 it's okay, Tech technology's, you know, it's 2020. I'm not quite good with it. <laughs> ah, here we go, here we go. Here we go, it's coming up. Okay. Right, have, you got, you got, there, have you got that? There it there is. There we go, yes. yes. Oh, that is cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody who's who's like my age or older definitely has seen a lot of these and would recognize it like instantly because we this yeah. <laughs> that is yeah, and this one here was was really quite interesting. So when you put the glasses on, the flute just sort of jumped out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And the reason why well, I mean, we only did an initial print run of three thousand because it was actually very expensive. I'm sure. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I'm with little three D glasses, and um, but what it got me thinking was that. Uh, with the poster, I was it's, it's a dichotomy there really. You think I'd like to take the brand differently to everywhere else, but when you think flute players, it's a serious thing to many people. They have their livelihood <laughs> teaching. Guys like you, it's got to be serious. You can't mess around because you're you're working on somebody's baby. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. let's, let's, face it, let's face it; they spend more time with this tube than they do with their partners. So, <laughs> yes, well, sometimes yes, it's yeah. serious business. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what you do is sort of very, it's very important. And you can't mess around. But being a small company, I, I felt we had a bit of a license to sort of deviate off and do sort of weird <laughs> things. And the, the basic form of branding and marketing is to get yourself known. You know, flute the flute world. There's so many brands. There's so many flutes. Yeah. just to be different mm -hmm. and then it's how can you be different without actually being sort of stupid and unprofessional and yeah. and this is where sort of social media when it started yeah. um it sort of coincided with me having the freedom to explore and put stuff out and see what stuck so if anyone's been following it, I mean, when I first joined Twitter, probably was it 10 years ago, my, my handle was flute, because no one was on it, but flute wow. players. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, um, but Instagram for me is the one that is, I have complete connectivity, mm -hmm. because there's, a, there's, there's a, an audience there. Yes. So for what we then did is that we said, okay, how can we be very different? How can we take what we believe is a good product but actually not tell people it's a good product. Mm -hmm. And there is method, method behind the madness, mm -hmm. is that you go to any flute event, people are saying how brilliant these are, how brilliant these are. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, somebody's got to play it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, if, and that is the point of everything. If someone plays your instrument and they love it, that's, that's it. You don't, they don't need to be told. Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. um, so what we want to do is come up with a strategy where we're actually saying, Try every flute in that price category. Don't necessarily choose us. Mm -hmm. We're not necessarily the best for you. Try every flute in that category. And if you choose another brand, absolutely wonderful because you've chosen a flute for you. Now, this was really quite hard for what well, Trevor for us to start. Sure. With. <laughs> <I'm> sure. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Wait. Because he's invested. He's invested in that because um, he fundamentally believes in the brand. Yes. And I said, for me, 
you know, I used to teach and I was a flute player. I didn't like to be told by anybody else this was the best. Mm -hmm. Some, you know, some yes. people can't afford often the best. You go to Eastern Europe and there's, I found professionals playing on student flutes. Mm -hmm. And I went, went to, once went to a, a master class in Greece and there was a guy called Costas Nicolaides and he was playing mm -hmm. a master class. You know, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Marion. That's how long ago it was. And he had a flute that was completely black. Mm. I mean, black. Yeah. And I just thought it was dead cool because he had a black flute. Totally but he cool. played beautifully. And Marion was just sort of sat there, just listening. Mm -hmm. In fact, second movement of the Ebert. That was what it was. Second movement of the Ebert. Absolutely <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. Anyway, and they, they, were, they were talking and I was just sort of transfixed. Anyway, afterwards, I caught up with this chap. I introduced myself. And I said, what flute are you playing on? And he said, oh, it's a Trevor James. I went, oh, really? <laughs> and I said, can I have a look? And the thing is, is that he had such acidic perspiration, there was no plating left. Right. Yeah. But he had no money. Yeah. He yeah. had no money whatsoever. And he was making use mm -hmm. with this tube he could yeah. afford. And yep. my word, it was beautiful. Yeah. It was absolutely beautiful. So taking the company to... So coming forward to saying, this is what we do, these are our values, but ultimately the flute player has to be the judge and the jury. Mm -hmm. uh, the teacher can help you along the way. The teacher will rightly have their preferences and that be based around experience often. Repairers will certainly have their preferences. <laughs> And we'll We're not that. opinionated at all. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no doubt we'll talk about my relationship with our chief technical director in a yes, minute. I, yes. <laughs> but the reason why the technical uh, aspect is just as valid as the teacher aspect is yes, you've got to have an instrument that is new that can give you the tonal colours, give you the projection, mm -hmm. enable you to create the story, the narrative, which you're doing when you're playing the flute mm -hmm. however if that flute is going to go out of regulation very quickly yep. or if it's going to um if there's going to be uh, split pads or if there is going to if it's got general weak mechanism yep. then that is going to be in and out of the repair shop well or if someone can't afford to get it repaired it's like even You've worse you're going to cause mind, tendinitis yeah. and hand issues and like you know all of the things that go along with if your flute is not keeping up with you and it's not functioning well, then it's like you get all of this anxiety over, oh my gosh, this other person can play this passage. Why can't I? I practice six hours a day. Why yeah. won't that low D come out, you know? Yeah. And not even realizing that it's not them, you know? It's just, oh. <laughs> yep. So for us, what we did is that we, we just, we, we spent five, six, seven years doing blind tests, going around the UK, going around Europe, with lots of different flutes and just getting people to blind test. That's really hard as a musician because you feel you're being judged, but you're not. And that was our aim. We, we didn't want people mm -hmm. to judge. We wanted to get their feeling of each model based around what they were feeling when they were playing it. Mm -hmm. So there'll be their products and there'll be other competing products and we'll be in that. But we learned so much from that. We learned what was it that they liked about it? What was it they felt? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, when that brand name is covered up, yeah. it all comes down to what you feel and the sound. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's really how we started along the road to doing things very differently. We didn't try and, we did brochures, but I'm, I'm not a brochure person. I've never liked brochure. I like directly speaking. Mm -hmm. And then you've got social media. You have direct access where we do the same thing. We send out samples. We send out new products for testing. And we wait for the feedback. Um, I think I mentioned the other day that I am a complete nuisance to any TJ distributor around the world. Mm -hmm. Is that if we've got an idea or, or a concept instrument, is that uh, I'm sorry, but I let everyone on social media see it before anybody else knows about it. <laughs> it's just a player a first approach. It is. It's a the player distributors first approach. are like, wait, we have this? What? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They do, yeah. And yeah. why do we do it? It's pure. It's my. I think I'd like to know whether there is an interest in it. Yeah. Mm. Um, like we we did an open G sharp flute. I know that's going to come up in another week, but we developed an open G sharp flute, which for me I thought, what's the point? 
Open G sharp isn't played by many people. Well, there's more people than I thought play an Open G sharp flute. Kind of fun. Yeah, so we made one, and then I just put the that's going to be about five hundred dollars. So it's it's based on our ten X. So it's a yeah. A good mechanism, student wow, A 10x essentially with the open G sharp. Yeah, people, I, I'm, 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 people contacting love that. The, I'm, I'm contacting them. I, I, I need one of these things. <laughs> An open G sharp makes a lot of sense when you play it. It drives my brain yeah. nuts. Yes. It's, it's a very humiliating play. experience for me to play an open G sharp. I, I, I already have an open G sharp flute, so I'm kind of used to doing the flip, but I love them for playing Granger. I don't know why. I love them for playing Granger stuff. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> oh, we have the flute for I, you. I was pretending, I was pretending to freeze then. <laughs> you almost got me. I was like, no. <laughs> uh, no, no freezing is Rachel's job. I tell you what, we'll give one away to one of your viewers at any time you want. So, where is an open G sharp flute, right? That we will give away whenever you want to give it away. We'll send it to, to you and just give it away. That'd be so much fun. We can have like a draw. We no, no, we can have like a draw. We're we're gonna start a we're gonna start a movement. <laughs> I actually, okay, <laughs> one of my college audition, you know, when you audition for college, you know, I was a flute performance major, you have to write the little essay that goes along with it. And my essay was in argument in favor of why everyone should be playing an open G sharp flute. And of course, really? Yes, <laughs> yes. And I had never played one and I still have never played one, but the idea just makes such a logical well, it does. sense to my brain. It does. Yeah, I was what, like, once your why brain not flips over? Yes. Well, so it's I, also I did, a way more in, sturdy. So I don't know. <laughs> it's a it's a much more sturdy tube. When you think about it, if you're gonna yeah. put a flute in the hand of a twelve year old, if you're gonna put on a flute, you want where to did they always bend? <laughs> 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 it's just like it is a very cool. elegant mechanism once you get used to it. I I found. Yeah. yeah. What's What's really funny is if you get someone to play and you don't tell them. Oh yeah, that's the <laughs> <a> difference. <laughs> That's a great trick. <laughs> That's a great trick. <laughs> it is. Wait, also, wait, also a great trick is forgetting to rehook the trill keys after you finish fixing <laughs> someone's flute and you hand it to them to task. And they go, oh, oh, and then everybody in the room panics, including me, and I go, oh, give me that back. And then, no, no, okay, now try. I didn't, I didn't do that at all last week, twice. No. <laughs> 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 Easiest, most dramatic fix ever. It is. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> uh, so over, over the years, we, we develop totally, we, we, unlike many other companies, we develop our instruments based solely by feedback. So we will come up, we, we'll come up with ideas, but not only our ideas, but the ideas from other people. And if it comes up quite a few times, we will then amalgamate it into a concept instrument. So, so, so all are, the look, so, for example, the reason we changed our silver head um, became a vote chain model probably 18 months ago um, mm -hmm. was because we found an instability in the cut. We were cutting it and the, when we were having them tested, well, the feedback we were getting is and we get some really, the, the head joints are fine, but some are much better than the others. And we were getting those mm -hmm. for quite a number of years. Mm -hmm. And I suppose ultimately, if you're cutting uh, an embouchure hole, if you're cutting a, a non, I would say a non-professional one, in other words, one that's got to be done, that's got to fit a certain price category, mm -hmm. you have a limited amount of time in which to cut it. And the issue you have is, you know, cutting an embouchure hole is, as, as you guys all know, you, you start cutting and then you can just, you can spend hours on it. Mm -hmm. And we, 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 we're not allowed that. We're not allowed that. <laughs> So there was a there was a an, an issue. I would say a big. It wasn't a big issue, but some played beautiful and others just didn't. They just played like normal. Mm -hmm. So what we really wanted to do come up with a really stable one, one that we knew that we it wouldn't take any. There'd be no finishing. So we came up eighteen months ago with a one piece slip and riser cast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the casting was based around um, CNC uh, a CAD drawing, and then it went mm -hmm. into a mold, and then we just took it back to the process of. 
I'm going to sound technical here. I'm going to I'll cut that out. David will um, speak to you about that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm definitely going to ask about that. because Anyway, we ended up with this one piece lip and riser. And then we sold yeah. it onto a tube. And we found that everyone played the same. Mm -hmm. Everyone it was really stable. And it was really big and meaty because it's one piece. Yeah. It was quite heavy, but it, some people liked it. Yep. Um, our aim was to actually launch it worldwide. Unfortunately, the Americans decided to... Um, take our complete production for the first year. It went mad. Wow. It went completely mad. Yeah. And then uh, precious metals um, went through the roof. Yes. Wow. Silver, definitely in gold. Wow. I mean, it's wow. weird now, isn't it, where platinum is cheaper yeah. than gold? Yeah, <laughs> yes. It's much cheaper. Yeah, and gold is used. So I was, I was talking about this with, with a jeweler because I, I, I do the custom crowns. You do. And, Yes, and, and she was, I was like, so, like, whoa, what are we going to, she's like, yeah, but it's so much harder to work with, like, it's still going to end up being I, more expensive because the soldering yeah. and the finishing and that she's like, it, it just, it wrecks, it's so hard, it just wrecks my wheels, like, I, yeah. there's no such thing as bargain platinum. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're paying one way or the other. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah, it'll always be more expensive, unfortunately. <laughs> Dang it. I know. So, so we then did. The market. <laughs> So for our work, there's a lot of silver in a casting. So what we then did is we developed, we, we developed the same um, cut, which is based around a flute maker that we use called Andrew, Andrew Oxley. He's a head joint maker in the UK. We, he cuts all our piccolo head joints. And, um, and we quite like the, pic the instability, not instability, but the differences in piccolo head joint cuts. Because we sit, we sit at a certain point. Um, shall I cover that after that, why we sit here? Yes. Um, so he cuts them and they, they play beautiful, but we wanted to use one of his and one of David's. We want to amalgamate David's and Andrew's um, thoughts on head joint production up to a certain level because we're not talking professional. Right. Because with TJ, we, we go up to a certain point and then yep. you go to one of the big boys. <laughs> uh, but you, you, you do like an amazing job of that, that segment far better than anyone else that the like consistency and stuff like that bang for your buck I, yeah wow speaking <laughs> of which at some point during this episode can we do a little dive into something that i feel like trevor james does an amazing job of that's very important to the flute world is your low flutes yeah yes please we talk low flutes okay um, the, the yeah well, we'll move on to that in a moment shall we is that my, yeah, my yeah. passion my pa my personal passion is the alto flute I absolutely me too. agree. I love that. And, me, me too. I, I have to buy one. Uh, yeah, just something about alto flutes that it's sort of almost primeval, isn't it? It's just it's, it's a sound. It's like a cello. It's, I mean, when you yes. hear old videos of um, you know, Yo-Yo Ma or, or Jacqueline Dupre, it just sort of, it takes you somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you hear an orchestra play, when, if you haven't got cellos in it, there is something missing. And, you know, if you listen to E.T. music and when mm -hmm. uh, Eric's going home, if you took the cellos out, you wouldn't cry because there's no <laughs> rising pattern, is there? Yeah. So I had, I was on a mission. Uh, crikey. It's a long time ago now. It's to try and get the alto flute popular because the alto, low flutes weren't that popular because they're quite rare. And, mm -hmm. and when you think, the only people using it was like flute band, uh, sorry, flute choirs. And so we developed our first alto flute, and the, the remit was it had to be affordable to the everyday player. Mm -hmm. And we made one, and the, you know, the, supply, the, the, the law of supply and demand is that the more you make, the cheaper it should become. Obviously, <laughs> to start off with, the demand wasn't there. <laughs> right. <laughs> so the, we, were, we lost money on each one, but we persevered. And that's, because, a, that's a big gamble to take too. I mean, it was, but my yeah. gut feeling was it would work because we don't, as I said, we don't go in the professional, we, we don't go into the professional market, but with alto flutes, we knew that because professional players have to spend so much, and rightly so, on their own chosen instruments, they, they should spend a lot of money on their concert flute. They should spend a lot of money on the piccolo. Two, one, two areas that they should spend, money, invest. If they can, they should invest. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the piccolo is one that is, if you invest wisely, you'll never need to buy one again because it will sing. I'm not saying that because Adam's there, but uh, it will sing. <laughs> um, 
Um, but we also then knew that there isn't a market. The, the best, I mean, the best alto flutes in the world for me are Cotato and Sankey. I mean, they are just beautiful, beautiful beasts. Ava Kingman makes a stunning alto flute. I love Ava's altos. But we, we thought, well, is there a market for anything underneath it? Well, I said, well, yeah, professionals would buy it if it wasn't that expensive. So we persevered. Yeah. So we've, over the years, we've made, we started with a silver plate, with silver lip and riser. Then we made a gold frosted and a black mm -hmm. frosted. Yes. Mm -hmm. that, that was a nightmare. Anyone who's, <laughs> ever, tried to, anyone who's ever tried to frost a flute, I mean, now again, this is, this is my fault. David didn't want to do it, but the tube has to be so clean and so dry that when it's yeah. frosted, and um, so we made about 50, 20 noirs, which are black frosted, okay. and I think most of those in the US, and we've made, I think, about 30 gold frosted mm -hmm. altos. And then David, our technical director, said, please, can we not make any more? <laughs> <We're done. laughs> so we, we went on to the black nickel, Yep. Now, I'm not a great... My favorite. Yeah. I love it. Um, yeah, I love that one. <laughs> <laughs> I have a number of clients with them. They love them. They're good-looking flutes. Yeah. I, I, find nickel, I find nickel slippy, so, I mean, it's not... It's not I, I get a silver-plated one, but I know people who love them more than life itself sort of type thing. They love the black nickel. Yeah, we, went, we did that just because of the resonance of nickel. Yeah. Um, and can you remind me, because I'll talk, tell you about my, our flute tubes in a minute, because I'll forget about this, because nickel's important. Um, even though there's a, we, we can't sell those in Europe because there's nickel release tests. So there's mm -hmm. European laws that we have to keep between, because all our instruments we have tested for nickel release um, rates. Uh, mm -hmm. So we made the black nickel, just because the sound was very much different from the silver. Mm -hmm. And then probably, I don't know, must be seven or eight years ago, I had this idea that... Um, and it was just me messing around with a bit of plumbing pipe, you know, a bit of copper plumbing. And I said to David, what would it sound like if you made a head joint out of copper? <laughs> and he said, well, they go a funny color. But anyway, he made the head joint out of copper. And I said, he's a good you know, why not? <laughs> should we give it a go? And he said, well, do you know how soft copper is? So I, I tasked him with, with it and he found a tube, it's, it all comes from Tanaka in Japan, and um, mm -hmm. the 85% copper tube. Mm. Now, another company that makes a very similar, but much more expensive alto, mm -hmm. uh, they, they use 65%. Um, okay. So we, we, that's as much as we could go was 85%. We tried going higher, but it was, it was almost a case that you could push it. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Yay for tax! That's awesome. yeah. but, like you could fold it up for storage. David's big concern, as it is technical person, is that copper goes a funny colour very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but we knew we we're on safe ground because the raw saxophones that we make, the professional saxophones. Verdigris very rarely came up. Mm -hmm. um, it just sort of naturally aged and went sort of a dark brownie colour. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I said to David, what could we do to stop that coming? So he said, um, well, let's put a, let's bake a very thin lacquer on and see how it mm -hmm. goes. So we, we baked a thin lacquer on and sent half a dozen out for testing. And six months later, they came, they, all six came back, they were fine. So we launched the copper. Mm. And that's probably our number one selling because it looks gold, doesn't it? It's, and it's <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's very glamorous. It yeah, and it doesn't break the bank. Um, and then I had this bit strange idea, as as I do, and I said to David, "What would happen if we didn't lacquer them?" And he said, "You know what's going to happen." I said, "Can, can we start making them? Because I'm sure somebody would <laughs> come make on, them." Come on. <laughs> so we made a couple, and David didn't want us to tell anybody about it. Because from a technical viewpoint, it's not clean. It's not. It's just very different. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as soon as we put them out as a raw, you know, raw copper tube, mm -hmm. the sax doublers jumped on it. Of course they. Did. Oh yeah, yeah. The grungier yeah. something looks, the better. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Patina, Sarah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Patina. <laughs> all, I mean, all, the, all of the, the like pump players and like bar players and stuff like that are like, this is awesome because they yeah. like it comes pre-fixed. Yeah, and it looks <laughs> the instrument actually looks filthy, but it, it goes a funny color. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But it, it zings. There's something about it where there's nothing on it that yep. zings. Yep. 
Yeah, well, yeah, saxophonists have been raving about that for years, you know, and, and they uh, have. trumpet you players and trumpetists. Yeah. And, yep. So at the moment, we've actually got a prototype copper C flute in testing. One Rock with or... Barry Griffiths. Barry Griffiths sees grizzly flute on Instagram, so he's got one out. And one's going to Miki Kim, flute professor in Paris. Excellent. Interesting, this interest, we, we want to know it. We, what we, we're after someone that's got acidic perspiration, because we want to know, ah. firstly, mm -hmm. does the um, lacquer last? Mm -hmm. Because we know it lasts in the alto flute, but we want to know, alto flute, you don't play that all day. So sure. does, it, does it on a concert flute yeah. last? Yeah. Um, I, I have, and also, I have a if, if you need more testers, I, I have some people in mind. <laughs> Sarah and I both have, have some people that, that, yes. that um, definitely could help you with that yes. project. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. You're testing for that, though. What's, yeah, what's, here we are. We're, we're at the south of testing. And um, the interesting thing is really light. It's a very light flute, but it looks gold. That's awesome. Yeah. It's very, very lightweight. So anyone that's got arm Wonderful. issues. So yeah. I'm, I'm hoping that in March, April next year, we'll have a definitive whether we go go for it or not. David will always be um, David will always be not convinced from a technical viewpoint. He will always worry about the the lacquer, the baked lacquer on the outside yes. on an instrument that could be played three four hours a day. I totally yeah. get that. Um, so yeah, we we just want to make sure that we are right before we put it out. And then obviously bases, we do black bases and we do um, silver plate bases. We try a copper, but we can't, we, when we try bending it, it goes from the shape. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. do, you, do you have any plans for anything lower than a base? You know, if we're a big enough company with uh, unlimited resources, I'd love to go to a contract. But yeah, um, yeah we don't. We, what we try and do is we, everything we learn, we try and feed down the food chain. Mm -hmm. So everything we learn about uh, in the instruments that we make, we like to bring them to an affordable price category, which is why our uh, silver head flute uh, has pointed key arms. It has 958 head joint, spoke shade two head joints, and it has a cherry wood case because we found out that people higher up the food chain have really posh cases, really expensive looking cases. So why can't normal people have good yeah. looking cases? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that is something that I think that you guys do incredibly well, too. And, and uh, Rachel brought this up when we were doing our pre-chat the other day where, you know, you were offering the two different crowns and, you know, yeah. everything yeah. really, really um, designed not only from a functional standpoint, but also from that aesthetic standpoint that makes people feel like they're not getting something that's less than. Um, and that is so, so important because flute players are judgy. <laughs> <laughs> no like, but yeah I mean, we, we all had that moment like I remember sitting you know first first day of like high school band looking looking down seeing who has the open holes and who doesn't right because to a 13 year old that was extremely important <laughs> yeah so something that looks and feels nice and elegant is yeah, is you right. know that's very helpful for high schoolers out there. It is, it is. And, and anything that gives you that psychological edge over, you know, people go, oh my goodness, what are you it. playing? You know, because it looks well, really striking or different or, or whatever. I think but, the, uh, oh, sorry. Keep I was just gonna finish that up with, but to, to not only have that uh, aesthetically pleasing aspect, but also to have it backed up by this iterative process of continued um, excellence in, in the build quality mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. I mean, it's that partnership yeah. that I think makes you guys really unique. It and doesn't just look good. Right. It's easy to make. Well, we all have seen the 99, you know, dollar flutes on Amazon that have pointed key arms and come with white gloves. Uh -huh. <laughs> they look beautiful. <laughs> but Buy a case, get a flute. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, Where the technicals? Oh, sorry, sorry, Kim. I was just going to say that that it's actually one of the things that was kind of fun. I my rent my loaner fleet is all Trevor James flutes, and it not only is it because it helps get that kind of name out there, but one of the things that was neat is I have a privilege as my is my my kind of everyday loaner, and it comes with the two crowns and. One of the things that it subconsciously says, maybe not so subconsciously, is it doesn't have to be a super, super expensive flute 
to have accessories and to be built well and to look well. And there's that, it, when you open the case, there's this sense of like extreme pride in doing a job well done that doesn't cost $10,000 for the so so like it it the first impression that a client gets or even me because I had forgotten it came with both crowns when I opened it up I was like bang for your buck <laughs> right <laughs> now I do take the gold crown out when it goes on a loner because it things get lost in loner land right because people are used to having two crowns so I do take it out when it goes out on loan but there's this huge the the, the visual that you get is really important because it backs up the fact that it's not mid-range to kind of cut corners it's mid-range done exactly right john paul have you, have you read the book joyful no i think you would really like that i can't remember the author but um it's, it's written thing. by an artist and her whole uh, you would you would love this book it, her whole perspective is that beauty brings us joy and therefore makes our lives better yeah. and so yeah. it's just read it <laughs> yeah. the yeah. really yeah. book club anything <laughs> <laughs> like that bit that yeah. appeals to me but i will say i i I think what we learn, what we feed down, we believe, it goes to the fact that why do we sit in the market where we do? Because, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we have made handmade flutes, and we do make handmade flutes, but we don't make handmade flutes to sell. We make handmade flutes to pass on to our artists. Mm -hmm. And the reason we don't sell them is it's very important for us to concentrate, learn by making handmade stuff, but concentrate on the market that we know best. And we know in this, in this day and age, you know, through COVID and also pre-COVID, is that a lot of people don't have the financial resources to call on their parents, on their grandparents, to help them out with a, a flute. So we believe that if we can just stay where we are in the category, and I, I always put it down to, I think I mentioned last time, it's about a car analogy, isn't it? Is that, you know, when you're, you know, if, if, if you want to buy a really suit a really good car to show how good you are or successful you are and it doesn't make it doesn't mean if you've got really posh flute or expensive flute that you're any good but if you're going to buy a, a, a good car you sort of don't necessarily look at a ford or a peugeot or a, a volkswagen you look at the bmws you look at the aston martins you look at the ferrari and for me the flute world is the same there is a distinction and there is a distinction for a reason is that the instruments that are, that are expensive have had a lot and lot of care and man hours put in to the making, the design and the materials. And we will, I will honestly say that we can't compete with that, nor should we compete. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when I look at uh, how Adam is making his piccolos, the amount of care he just has on that tube, that wooden tube before anything is done, you know, that in itself is time, is money. Yeah. But also, it then comes down to how it plays in later life. Mm -hmm. All that care and attention. And that is why instruments cost a lot of money. Because mm -hmm. they've had a lot of work done. Because we sit where we sit, there is this constant friction between us and our technical team. I was just going to ask you to talk more about that. <laughs> 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 and, and rightly so. I mean, we are the sum of our you know, spinal, co spinal cord, which is the technical team. Because if, if we were to cut the spinal cord, we wouldn't function. Because if we put instruments out that people didn't like or suddenly started finding fault with, mm -hmm. we would die overnight because we're still a small English company. But because of our technical team, because we give them freedom to, we give them parameters that we can you know we have the instruments so it's solely because of them and the work they put in that we um we we are where we are where the conflict comes is when we come up with new products or i mean we we fundamentally believe in kaizen the japanese process of constant improvement yes. so for us constantly improving without changing the product names is for us uh, important and we often don't tell people we would just change we'll just put an improvement in and we'll just mm -hmm. feed it through but the issue we have is that the technical team and david our technical director in particular is a perfectionist 
So he would love to create really expensive flutes. He would love to be able to add something in. I mean, he's a Rudel Cart nut. I mean, he's got, he's, he, he's designed this key on a, a flute that is, doesn't, yeah, it doesn't need to be designed really. <laughs> and we put it out for testing and people didn't know why we did it, but. Um, it's still cool. <laughs> it, it is cool. Um, <laughs> But what we say is we, we want this instrument to sit in this price category. Mm -hmm. And to sit in this price category, we've got to be able to build it ready to go out with all the work at this price. Yeah. And I, I would argue, feel, sorry, sorry. I, I was just going to quickly interject and say, like, I, I would argue that that process takes an even higher level of genius than working with an unlimited budget and, and being given free reign to go to perfection like it, those parameters i mean i have so much respect for for your technical team because yes here, here's here's the money we have make yeah. the absolute best well, thing you can ever do and continue improving it with that same amount well, of money is, yeah. it's, it's like the astronauts who get who get stranded in space you know and something fails and they have to build a life support system out of like you know a coffee can and some duct tape <laughs> like does that happen <laughs> I, I don't know, but like, you know, like, you can do the best you can. No, I, I have a huge amount of respect for that too. That, that, that here's the amount of money. This is the cap. Yeah. You have to make yeah. it amazing. Yeah. Well, also and, that um, their input is valued too. You know, I, I think a lot of companies fall short there where they're not listening, you know, to the technical team. And um, that's, thank you, you know, for loving that's... your technical team yeah. and, and being so devoted to listening to us <laughs> as techs because. <laughs> I don't, I don't understand what you talk about. I don't understand your language. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure a, sometimes a, we know what we're yeah, As a player myself, I, I know that when you give my flute to somebody who knows what they're doing, when I get it back, I have my baby back. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. for me is the genius, is that even though I think it's pretty, it looks pretty obvious to me, a flute, but I don't touch it because I know that when it comes back, you've done something. And for me, that is so important. So if, if I'm feeling that, so would every uh, teacher and music store that has step up students and conservative grade students and students of, that don't have the funding. So for us, the reason we don't go into the professional category is we leave it to those that do, those that understand it, those that have the resources to do it, but also those that want to get as close to perfection as possible, we can't. And that is the, where the, it's quite hard for a technical team, our technical team to be told, look, you're actually making them too good. You're taking too long on them. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, that is a really hard discussion to have, yeah. to actually say you're making them too good. Yep, yep, and, and then. Yeah, and then they have to pivot again and figure out yeah. like, okay, well, we know that we want it to play like this. What can we do to get there faster, right? Yes. And, and so it's this constant refinement of like, what seems like an impossible task? Like, how do you make a flute that is stable over time and responds well, but do it quickly? I mean, that is the, the ultimate, uh, just, it, it's, it's two opposing ideas, really. Yeah. And, 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 where and, and works for text. Yeah. Like, yeah. it, because I, I love getting them in the shop because they actually just work and they play and they're stable and, and you don't have a, you don't, you don't feel like you're, you're sort of like trying to make something happen that was, it was never designed to do because the design is so strong that it, it helps. Yeah. And, and specifically the, the build quality too, in that yeah. there are a lot of, there are a lot of flutes in that area of the market that sound really good right you mm -hmm. pick it up and you go whoa i can't believe this flute only costs x right mm -hmm. x but yeah. then when i see them on my bench and i go wow all of the pivots are crooked and the yeah. keys are actively self-destructing because they're <laughs> gritty <laughs> and it's like you know and i can't seat this pad because of the way that it was installed like there's literally no way for me to like work on this without replacing it right like it's like all of those frustrating details that when i get a flute in that wasn't built with care that sounds really good right so it's like they they got that like let's make it sound really good but we're gonna really sacrifice on the build quality and 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 telling someone who bought that flute that it's gonna be as much as they paid for the flute for me to like fix it <laughs> is 
hard. That's hard. That's a horrible that's a conversation. conversation. We hate. Yeah. It's, and so, it's, it's so brutal. to have, yeah, to, to, to have a product that not only sounds great, but is also fixable is like the holy grail. <laughs> and it just, yeah. it makes me happy. <laughs> So there is always a, as a, David is involved in everything. He's involved in all the research and de development, obviously. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I will com both come up with wacky ideas and we'll just throw them on the wall and we'll see what fits. I mean, he wants to bring the Brosseresh shark back on a, a flute. You know, he wants to, <laughs> it's just, he wants to do things. And we say, if you can, if we can make it in a certain price category mm -hmm. and people want it, then we'll run with it. Same yeah. with the Arto flute. We'll see if it has legs. Mm -hmm. And then we're running, and now we've just every auto float we make, we sell every auto and base. We yep. actually can't make enough. Absolutely. I think um, 40 or 45 percent of my alto and base clients play TJ. Yeah, the ones that the ones that they play in like flute choirs, and it's their secondary or tertiary instrument where they need it. Yeah, they're not playing it 25, like you know, 25 hours a week, they're playing it, you know, a couple hours a day, maybe. Um, I think uh, almost 50% play Trevor James low flutes. And what, what's, and what's I, interesting about, about players that play it? I mean, there's a lot of players that uh, are endorsed by other brands. And they say, <laughs> oh, oh, can we be part of your family? I said, yes, but I play X brand. I said, I don't care. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. I, it doesn't yeah. really matter to me it's what okay. you play. And I think that comes back to our motto, which is we have a tagline. I don't like taglines because no one ever remembers them. And our, ours, ours is making life sound beautiful because ultimately yeah. we're, mu we're all musicians. Of, you know, we've all needed music in these COVID times. And mm -hmm. also we realize how important music is to us, but at its root, music shouldn't, it doesn't have to be expensive. So we, we stay within these confines of making a very, a very big uh, first flute up to silver tube. And then anything else we just make from for the artists that say, can you make us um, a fused flute using gold and silver? Yeah, we'll do that, but we won't make gold flutes. We do gold plating or gold bonding, mm -hmm. yeah. um, but we, won't, we will not make anything above it just because we can't make them. And this is weird to say we can't make them as good as those that spend their lives making them. I can't make a piccolo, or we can't make a piccolo like, like Adam. Mm -hmm. um, and if we did, Adam would win every time because it's Adam. Because, <laughs> uh, 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 no, a brand name has a, has, but, has, yeah. a, has a value. Well, and they're very different. Um, they, they all look like flutes, they all look like piccolos, yeah. but they are vastly different creatures, you know, when, when you get into the guts of, of them. And, and it's hard to explain that to someone who's not really spent time Yes. You know, um, but yeah, it, it's not, you know, when people are like, why would I ever spend, you know, $65,000 on a flute? Is it really, you know, that many tens of thousands of dollars better than, you know, my $4,000 flute? And uh, <laughs> well, it's a different creature entirely. You know, it's, it's not, they, it's, they're both called flute, but they're, they're different creatures. Yeah. And um, yeah. yeah, I would, I normally say the, if you're paying a lot of money for flute or piccolo, it will take you on a journey. It can be sensitive with you. Mm -hmm. It can be mm -hmm. bold with you. It can be strong. It can be shy. It can, it can project your emotions because that's the aim of making it. Mm -hmm. We try and do it in a lesser sense in the market that we are in. And that's why we spend, or David spends most of his time on the head joint design because yeah. that is the engine room of the flute. Mm -hmm. Once we, we're confident we've got a good mechanism, so the, the engine room is the most important. So that's why we don't go above it. Yeah. And David would love to, but we won't. <laughs> so we're, uh, we're, we're almost out of time, which is a shame because oh, no. I could do this forever. Um, but speaking of we David. We should have you back. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> speaking of David, David will be here next week um, talking with our tech patrons. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you have not yet joined our Patreon, please, please do if you're a technician and you want to pick David's genius brain <laughs> about all the things that go on uh, in, the, in the making of a Trevor James flute. And um, Jean-Paul, you actually had some questions uh, submitted to you. Were there um, any, I, we probably can't get to all of them, but were, were there any that really jumped out at you as ones that you wanted to answer? I didn't write them down. I sent them to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just, Rachel, was there anyone that, that, that stuck out for us that 
we're like must answers because I do have one thing that I'd like you to talk about really briefly just before we like leave. Uh, okay. so. yeah, go on. Um, the, I don't think we've talked about it yet, but it's early here, so maybe we have. Um, is the fact that you have a program that helps get flutes in the hands of um, of players that are, are unable to afford uh, afford instruments? Um, yeah, we have. A so, if you can maybe just mention that, like briefly. Yeah, we have a <laughs> we have a music foundation that we set up a few years ago. And it's to help those talented individuals that don't have the resources or funding um, for whatever means. They just don't have either su the support from their parents or guardians or the funding. And we donate instruments directly to the teacher or to the store or to the repair person. And we, we normally keep it quiet. We just, we offer this process. It's, it's our way of supporting, putting back. Because um, for us, it's important because no one should be disenfranchised because they don't have the, the money. And we, we are, <laughs> and we do it for our flute and our sax friends as well. So we have an annual budget that we put in and people apply to it. It goes to, to the trustees committee and um, hopefully they're not listening now, but every, everybody I put through always get their awards. <laughs> I think I just, I think that's such an amazing thing because I played on a flute that was the best I could afford for a really long time, but I had to buy it myself. Um, and I see, I, I do clinics for, for students in schools and the schools can't afford stuff and the students can't afford things. And I think that it says a lot about a company that's so dedicated to giving back, especially quietly. You know, there's no big poster saying, look at how amazing we are for doing this. It's, it says a lot that a company um, is dedicated to growing musicians from the beginning mm -hmm. and making it accessible to kids that are often high risk and need an outlet and need mm. all of that. So, so thank you for that. Thank you for, for having it available because it literally changes lives. I mean, I, I won't get all sappy, but I think probably having flute, um, because I'd practice like hours and hours a day, probably saved my life as a teenager. Oh. And we okay. never know those stories. Like you, you just, you never know those stories. So th thank you for, for being able to do that. Cause it's, it's huge. Oh, it's very sweet of you. But from a, a purely branding perspective, it's a no brainer because. Well, the yes, but the I teacher, mean. <laughs> the teacher gets to see them playing the flute. The teacher understands it. And they, the teacher then looks at the brand in a different way. It's a no brainer. The whole industry yeah. should do it. The whole industry they should support. Um, but they win win. <laughs> It is. You yeah. don't. That's true. It's life, true. life isn't about making money. Life isn't about, and that's how you know we exist because we make instruments and we make enough to support the factory and support our staff. But life isn't all. Music isn't about profit. Music is about beauty. And for us, it is if we can invest in and put back in, then you know we're happy. I can sleep at night and I can smile and just be as mad as I want to be. <laughs> Uh, uh, one, one, said. one question that did, did jump out was from Lisa Nelson. She's the chair of the British Flute Society, mm -hmm. who said, what is the fine line between having the fun you do, because we have a lot of fun, mm -hmm. and the hard work? Uh, ultimately, that you, you, you wear two heads. You wear a head that is, uh, you have fun, <laughs> and have, I have the most fun. Actual yeah. heads. Yeah. Yeah. Actual heads. <laughs> <laughs> It's like serious. <laughs> <Zaffon. laughs> it's, it's, it's really easy. There is times you know when you have to be sensible and there's times you, you know you have to be fun. Luckily, I do all the social media and the web designing and everything. So my life is easy. My life is wonderful. Talk to David and he's very, he's, he's very sensible and he's very in the zone. Um, but for me, I think people who know me would say most of the time, I just, because I don't take myself seriously, I just, I dip in and I dip out of fun and being sensible but what is sensible i mean if, if you can make somebody smile you connect as a musician if you can get someone's hairs on the back of their neck to go up you've got the audience mm -hmm. if someone can pick up an instrument and go wow or the parent can go wow or pick an instrument from you that they bought in that didn't play that in itself when you see their face and their eyes is worth everything mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so I, I, it's easy to balance <laughs> well, good I, answer. Yeah, I can't think of a better way to wrap this up. 
<laughs> I mean, it, 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 it comes down to, you know, we all live on this planet together. And I think that what are we doing if we're not making each other's lives better? Yes. And 2020 has real... been kind of like very revealing in that. Mm-hmm. It is like how to how to reach out and help each other get through tough times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if somebody ever asks you what is the best flute, there isn't one. The best flute is what is the best flute for you. Exactly. And same, same with I think we say that. I think we all say that every single day. What's the best flute out there? The one that suits you best. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The one that gives you the voice that you hear inside your head that you want to share with the world. That's and, the best flute for you. And, and you know, as, you know, all five of us get to play a whole lot of yes. flutes. <laughs> and I think that <laughs> the more flutes you play, the more you realize that there is no such thing. As yeah, the, 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 less fav- the less that you have a favorite, I think, mm-hmm. too. Yes, because yeah. they're all different. And, you know, who are you in that moment? Who are you going to be five years from now? What does your face feel like that day? Uh, it's just, you know. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah. that and, and that's why we say if you choose if you're a step up flute flute player or intermediate flute player and you choose a Trevor James, thank you. <laughs> if you don't choose a Trevor James because you've fallen in love with another brand, well done. Thank you. <laughs> weird because I think that that's such an amazing approach too, because it's it's just such a holistic and, and yes. nice way to view the whole thing. It's, it's, it's about growing players. It, yes, and absolutely. it's honest you know and for yeah. me, integrity is, is probably one of the traits that I, I value the most and I, I I'm a ta- terrible salesperson because I will oh. never, never tell somebody like like you I will never tell somebody this is the thing that you should get you this know is, this because is I, can, I don't know maybe it's not the thing they should get <laughs> Yeah, I'm past owner of the company. I should be, I should be extolling the virtues of Trevor James Flute. But at the end of the day, so, I think it makes people trust you more because you, you are in your yeah, own way, right? Because they know that you're not being that slick salesperson who's just trying to feed them a line, you know. And if at the end of the day, you know, you go, oh wow, you know, I heard you play my Trevor James, and I heard you play this other company, but oh, that other one, do yeah. it. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, you know? I think that the, the, the honesty and the openness yeah. and just the the dedication that that Trevor James as like a company yeah. is yeah. is uh, not unique, but it's certainly special. Like I think all companies have have a certain really? type of 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 that, but it's certainly special. And um, I I love being able to sort of help get that name out there more. Because well, it's you. it's not very it's it's not as well known in Canada, and mm-hmm. I would love to be able to get it into the hands of more students mm-hmm. because flutes are very expensive in Canada. Our dollar is sixty, uh, seventy six cents U.S. right now, which means a uh, five thousand dollar flute ends up costing you almost seven seven thousand dollars, seventy five thousand mm-hmm. dollars, or seventy five hundred dollars. So I mean, flutes are really expensive in Canada. And being able to get really nice flutes into the hands of students who would otherwise be stuck on their very beginning flute is amazing. Oh. So. Well, we, we, are, we are what we are, and you, know, you, you get what you get with and us. we appreciate and, uh, you. And, <laughs> and we love exactly that about you. That's what makes a huge difference, is that you want to be that. It's not, it's not like second for you. It's no. the primary, it's your primary focus, which is that is unique. But also at, at the, at the risk of people watching going, oh, well, I guess they're not that good. That's not what we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're amazing. I <laughs> they're really good. over some so. other brands because I could, I could yes. safely give a flute that cost half as much out as loaners and the players would go, wow, wait a minute, how much does this cost? Yes. Um, yes. They wouldn't feel like they were getting half as much flute. They just felt like they were getting twice as much flute. Mm-hmm. Um, so, no, they're, they're amazing. I love them. I'm so, I, I, I'm honored and proud to have them in my rental, in my, my loaner mm-hmm. flute. Cause, yeah, it, yeah. You're very sweet. It's like a professional going into a flute store and there's a Brennan, there's a Powell, there's a Haynes, there's a, an Arista, there's all these flutes uh, along there, and then they choose the one that works for them. Uh, all I'm saying is that when you're on step yeah. ups as a student, you follow the same process. Mm-hmm. Don't be told oh, yeah. necessarily. Absolutely. So, yeah, 
I love ours because I'm invested in it, but ultimately for us, it's the musician has to choose the one that's right for them. Fabulous. I'm shocked. I'm still shocked you guys had me on because we haven't talked technical and that's wonderful. <laughs> but you know, you know what? One of the things that we want to do is reach out to players and help players understand their instruments better and understand the choices that are available without without sort of like dictating stuff. So, I mean, we we all love Trevor James Blues and stuff like that, but I mean, we want people to be able to learn more about the instruments and to see the faces behind the instruments. Yeah. Because and these are huge investments. So it, it it's a big deal for, for a company to take the time out mm -hmm. to, especially halfway around the world, um, to take the time out to talk to us and talk to players and share their love for flutes and stuff that that says a lot <laughs> so and yeah. I, I think too that uh, you know it's it's we don't necessarily aim to be an entirely technical show either so, yeah. so part, I, I'm, a, I'm a nerd we all know this but I grew up every week <laughs> <laughs> listening to a show called car talk on npr yes. um <laughs> yes with my dad you know, you know, did it. <laughs> so yeah. anyway but car talk was these two amazing brothers uh thick boston accents no bs you know and and they would just go on for an hour answering people's questions about cars and you know as an 11 year old i don't know anything about cars <laughs> <laughs> just, <laughs> but they were so entertaining and you know I grew to trust them because they clearly knew what they were talking about and if they said that a Honda Accord was a great car and would yeah. last forever like I'm getting a Honda Accord <laughs> like it doesn't <laughs> matter whether I understand what they're talking about it's it's that they know clearly know and they're not out to uh sell me anything they're not out to you know, um, there's no angle there. Like they're purely yeah. just trying to give yeah. good information. And so that was kind of what we wanted to do where it's like- <laughs> We're flute car talk. We're the flute car talk, yeah. <laughs> well, someday maybe we'll get that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but th that's really our goal is to, to be, you know, we have the knowledge, but we don't want to like hit people over the head with a screwdriver every week. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and we want people to see that, that techs aren't stuffy and obnoxious and like, uh, you know, there's a lot of preconceived, there's some preconceived notions about text. And I think that, that we've kind of hopefully shown that, I mean, we're fun and we're friends with each other. I mean, we're, we're, we're from two different countries and we help support each other and, and we, you know, all of that kind of fun stuff. And we're um, never going to talk down to somebody just because they don't understand the technical aspects. Like that's not a player's job. That's not a player's <laughs> Well, and we're not going to talk down to you because you can only afford a $1,500 flute instead of a $20,000 flute. That doesn't make you a lesser client. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think that's the other thing is, is that, that all of our clients are, are, you know, valuable to us and we, we want to help them have the best experience. And if you can afford a $1,500 flute, then I will do my very best to make your $1,500 flute the very best $1,500 flute you ever had. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have a $60,000 flute, likewise, <laughs> I will help you fall in love with it even more because it's three cars. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's more like 12 of my car. <laughs> <laughs> like new cars. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think we like that format just to make it like accessible and friendly and yeah. In an old English way of saying it, I doff my cap to you doctors and nurses <laughs> of the instrument world because without, without you guys, and you know, you don't come up for air much, do you? You don't sort of walk around and um, pick up instruments and say, look at me, look at me. You're, you're in the background and our technical team were always in the background, mm -hmm. beavering away. You know, I get out there, I'm seen, and other people are seen, but the most, the most important part of our company, the backbone of the company, are always hidden. And, um, you know, without you guys putting right in an emergency, or even a not an emergency, our beloved tubes, you know, we wouldn't be able to play. We wouldn't be in the position we are. So, uh, you know, on, from the outside, I thank you guys back. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your time today. And, oh, and anytime. Nice I can talk to you.
Yeah, oh, we'll, we'll have you back. We can we'll talk to you. <laughs> we, need, we need to have you back. It'd be, it'd be great. So um, we really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so uh, anybody who's watching, if you have questions, feel free to drop yes. them in the comments and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them. Text watching, please uh, join our Patreon. Join us next week where you can uh, talk to David uh, on the Patreon. That'll be a, a really good time. And that's a live chat. So you can, you know, interact, be on the Zoom call with him. Um, and uh, John Paul, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I've loved so it. I've loved, right. it. I've loved it. I've loved seeing right. faces as well. Excellent. <laughs> all right. And thank you to Thanks. all the people who are watching. Uh, we, we couldn't thank do this you. without people who wanted to see what we had to say. <laughs> so, <laughs> till next time. <laughs> okay, everybody. Thanks.